All right, everybody, before we start, make sure you visit my website, BeforeTheLightsPod.com, and click on the Vegas.com banners at the bottom of the website to get the best deals in Las Vegas for shows, hotels, and vacation packages. Go to the website, BeforeTheLightsPod.com, and click the Vegas.com banners. Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome to Before the Lights Podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark let's get this show started go get your coffee or get a drink and sit back and settle in today on the show we have a country music singer she's a songwriter a reality tv star a fifth place finalist on nashville star she was a contestant on survivor south pacific and the 25th season of amazing race She's got a southern smooth voice and country as a butterbean. Please welcome to the show, Whitney Duncan. Whitney, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. You reminded me of some of the things I've done I've maybe even forgotten about. (laughs) Let's start here. Born in Scotts Hill, Tennessee. I understand it's a very small town of about 900 people. Is is that a one red light town? It is a one blinking red light town. All right. All right. Yes. It's a four, a four way stop. Um, yeah, it's, it's tiny. And it honestly, you know, it's grown a little bit through the years. Um, we still have one gas station, one restaurant, you know, uh, we now actually have a dollar general. So it's big time. It's booming. Uh, yeah. So it's still, it's still really small, but I love that about it. You know, it's like taking a step back in time whenever I go home and I still do go home quite often because my parents are there, my grandparents. Um, so I, I go back quite a bit. Speaking of grandparents, your grandfather's the one that kind of introduced you to music. Very true. Yeah, he was, I mean, he, he could sing. He didn't, he wasn't a singer by any means, but um, he worked on the pipeline when I was growing up and I was a big granddaddy's girl. So when I would, when he would be home, I just couldn't get enough. I would stay at their house and he would play Elvis movies and Elvis like performance cassettes, you know, and we just loved, I just loved Elvis. And then he got me into Jerry Lee Lewis also. And we would watch, you know, great balls of fire and all those things. So yeah, he really helped fuel my love for music for sure. So how did you then get into singing from listening to Elvis with grandfather to, okay, now I want to start singing. I I mean, I, from like age three, four, I would sing and I would tell my mom that I guess it mainly started in church. Okay. That was my brother was taken. My brother's about three and a half years older than me and he was taking piano And so I would sing with him when he was playing piano and our first performance ever was at church for, I think the Christmas program, if I'm not mistaken, I think I was four maybe. And he played the song way too fast. (laughs) And my mom said, it's like, you couldn't even tell what the song was. It was so bad. (laughs) And I, as a sassy little four year old, you know, stomped off stage and told my brother, I was never singing with him ever again. (laughs) (laughs) And did you? I mean, around the house, but not really like he, his time, I think he just tried to mess me up. <laughs> so at age 13, I understand you were offered a record deal, but was that a legit offer? So I just through the years kept doing festivals and there was a place Loretta Lenz has this, um, competition every year. And it was around Waverly, Tennessee, which is not kind of halfway between Nashville and my hometown. And I would go perform every year. And there was a guy there that was a Nashville guy that approached my parents. I mean, I, yeah, I might even have been 12. I was 12 or 13. I was very young. Approached my parents about doing a, um, some recordings. But so we came to Nashville. We met with him. I knew this is what I wanted to do from way early on. I would tell my mom, it was just kind of a known fact. It was never even in question. Like this is, this is what I want to do. Um, and so they brought me to Nashville. I mean, they were very hesitant from the get go. I mean, my mom wanted me to be a doctor, you know, like she, (laughs) this was not, this wasn't their plan to do what I'm doing, you know, (laughs) and, um, something a little bit more stable, I guess. Um, so anyway, we met with this guy in Nashville 
Um, he was going to charge my parents, shoot, I think it might've been 10 grand at the time, but that time, at that time, that was a lot more expensive than it is now for like three songs. He was going to produce it. And, you know, he would say he would get it around town. And so I was going to a vocal coach in Memphis. Um, and my parents told him about it and he's just like, no, if he's going to charge you, then I just would be very leery about that. And he's, he had a natural contact an entertainment attorney that he said, he's like, if y'all are going to go to Nashville and she really wants to pursue this, then let me get you with some people that are legit, that won't steer you in the wrong direction. So that's what we did. We met with a guy that was an entertainment attorney who ended up later becoming my manager and uh, just a great, great guy that was just a good mentor for a long time for my parents and for myself. So that when you were 12 or 13, that first break came there because you got connected with the right people. It, it did. It did make the connection. Yeah. Uh, starting to go in the wrong direction, but set it in the right direction for sure. And met with the right people. And um, yeah, I got straightened out pretty quick. And, and that's when I really started songwriting as well. So this guy in town helped set me up with some co-writes. He's like, you know, if this is what you really want to do, you need to start writing songs. And I mean, I already, I had already, you know, written some around home, whatever that was no good. And just goofing around on my guitar and stuff. And I had some ideas, but do you write all of your songs currently? Um, no, I've actually recently cut a couple of outside songs, um, that I just heard and just fell in love with. So, um, it's kind of new for me, but yeah, I mean, I live in a a city of the best song songwriters in the world. So it, it makes sense to look outside, you know, of my own skill. I don't, think I'm the best songwriter in the world for sure. There's a lot way better than me. Are you so, still actively um, songwriting? I am. I am. I'm doing a lot on zoom. Not as much as I used to, um, obviously because of COVID and, and all of those things. But, um, there are some people that are still doing in-person rights, but mostly it's, it's zoom right now. Um, but yeah, it's definitely still a couple times a week, uh, still writing, thinking about, uh, I do have some music coming out in the next couple of months. Thinking forward to after that, you know, what's next. Talk to me, Whitney, about performing at Tootsie's Lounge in downtown Nashville, which is for our listeners may not be familiar with it. It's right across the alley from the famous Ryman Theater. Yeah, so it's um, it's a very famous place. Everybody, you know, all over the walls, you see all the pictures, everybody that's ever been um, in the music industry has performed there. I played there as a little girl. I wasn't old enough to even be in a bar, (laughs) (laughs) but my parents took me in during the day. They had like a really good house band and you could get up and perform with a house band. And so I thought I was a really big deal getting up there, probably saying stand by your man, uh, (laughs) Tammy Wynette, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's a cool, cool experience because we did, you know, I grew up a couple hours away from Nashville, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Like Nashville or Memphis would be the big cities that we would go to as a child. So, yeah, I, I made a few trips downtown. And, you know, I just remember leaving. I don't know if it was that specific trip, but leaving Nashville, my parents had a minivan and I was sitting in the back seat and I was just looking at all the lots. And I'm like, I'm going to live there one day. Like I just knew it. So now I do. Here I am. That's awesome. <laughs> You appeared on Kenny Rogers' single, My World Over, which is on his 42 Ultimate Hits LP. How did that collaboration take place, and what was it like working with such a legend as Kenny Rogers? Yeah, I I mean, he's amazing. Just one of the best voices I've ever heard. Um, That happened. I had signed a record deal. I was 16 at the time with Capitol, and... I was coming to Nashville, making trips all the time and still in high school. And, um, I had turned in three songs. Um, the producer was Keith Stegall, which he produced all of Alan Jackson, big producer. Um, I had turned in three sides and I guess Kenny had been in the office and was listening for a new single that was going to go to radio, something, something new, for his 42 ultimate hits album. So he heard it, he heard somebody playing it, popped in and, you know, he's known for his duets. And so they thought, 
they kind of cooked up this idea. He loved the song. He loved my voice. I was like, I mean, I would love to sing with Kenny Rogers. Are you kidding me? You know, right. Um, dream, dream come true. And so, yeah, he heard the song, loved it. And so he went into the studio. We kept my take of the vocal. He laid his down. I got to hear him sing the song, which was really cool. I mean, I was, I guess I was 17, probably 17 or 18 at that point. And, um, and then we did a music video and then I got to tour with him for a summer. And that was like my first, I actually used his band, my first experience on that big, that big of a stage, you know, with that kind of, of crowd. So pretty cool. I'll bet. That's a great experience. So yeah. did, did that lead you then into going into Nashville star? It did. So kind of from there, I had a record deal. Honestly, the, the single with Kenny, they introduced it to radio, but it wasn't like some radio success. And so, uh, just some things happened. I had been at Capitol for a while. Like I didn't really see it going anywhere. And I met a new producer and he was of the opinion that it was, it was a good time to start all over. I mean, I was 19, you know? Um, so I left that label, started over with him, got a new publishing deal, was writing songs all the time. And we had, we had done some recordings, but we really weren't in a place to like, um, pitch it to labels yet. And so I got a phone call actually. It's like, Hey, would you want to do Nashville star? And I, I had watched, you know, it was, it was big at the time. And, um, I was kind of of the mindset, why not? Like it, why wouldn't I, I, the only thing, you know, to gain was some fans. And the only reason not to do it was it, at that time, uh, those shows were looked at a little differently in Nashville. Like, like Carrie broke that mold, you know, mm -hmm. but like, Everybody else was just like, you wouldn't do a singing show. You know what I mean? Like, it was not as cool as it is now. Right. That was in the infancy stages when it was all happening. Exactly. Reality TV was new. It was new. Um, so I did it and, you know, got, I think, fifth. Yeah, I don't even remember now. Casey Musgraves was actually on my season, um, funny enough. Yeah. I mean, it did what I wanted it to do. It did start a little bit of a fan base. Um, I actually skinny dipping was one of the songs I performed and that comes into play later, which is really funny. But, um, Warner brothers was the label that was running that season of Nashville star. Okay. And so I obviously didn't win Nashville star. Um, but later that year, um, I had started recording some more things. I'd met another producer, John Shanks, which he was an LA guy. He was here in town making a Bon Jovi record. And, um, I met him, started writing with him. Then him and my old producer, Mark Bright came together and decided they wanted to work together the first time ever on a, making some music for me. And so we took kind of what we had started on and pitched it to Warner brothers. And this was LA Warner brothers. And I got a record deal with the people, half the people I wanted, had no idea that they were even a part of Nashville star or that I had even been on Nashville star, which is just fu so funny to me. But yeah, so I signed with that label later that year and off we went making that first full album. And that was right road. Now that came out in 2010 and yeah. a couple of those singles hit the hot country songs chart. Mm -hmm. When I said I would, and we, you mentioned skinny dipping, when I said I would, it's also a good song. You got two really good songs there. Thank you. Let's let's kind of talk about Skinny Dipping. It's a summer song. What was the influence behind it? Yeah, I wrote Skinny Dipping. Fun fact, I had never been Skinny Dipping. Honestly, don't know that I really still have. Um, <laughs> but the funny thing is, is I wrote this with one of my really good friends, Chris Tompkins. At the time, we were like, you know, he had this title and, you know, he's from Alabama. I'm from Tennessee, like very close. We were both very blues influenced and kind of had a, a groove going. And 
but you kind of like have to visualize it. You have to see it happening. Like, where is it? What's street? Like what river is it? And so we wrote skinny dipping around, um, the area that I was actually baptized in <laughs> fun fact. And the, and the video is really good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. So skinny dipping, I had to talk, I had to pull teeth at the label to get them to let me release that song. That was not right road. Now was complete. And okay. we were looking for a single, um, I really love so sorry, mama. I kind of fought for that to be the first single. It ended up being when I said I would, which I do love as well. But, um, I just didn't think it was right to be the first release. So many, so many things that people don't even know, go into all these conversations, you know? And, um, so I talked them into letting me record skinny dipping, like a new version of it. And so I did, and it was my, Technically my third single, they released the bed that you made for a, for a hot second and then pulled it like a couple weeks in. Um, so anyway, yeah. And you mentioned, so sorry, mama, was that the single that made footloose? Yes. Okay. So sorry, mama was, um, yeah, that, that actually all happened very cool as well. I'd actually flown to LA to shoot a version of if you know the Footloose soundtrack, I, I did a version of Fake ID, which is a song I didn't write. Uh, John Rich was big and rich, actually cut that one. And I was thinking that Fake ID went on went on the Footloose soundtrack. And I showed up to the premiere and they're like, oh, no, like, it's so sorry, Mama. I'm like, what? I didn't even know so, so, that was even an option. <laughs> Great. I'm so excited. But. I just, it's just funny how that all happened. And I was shocked and just super excited that that got included on the Footloose soundtrack. Let's take a break from music. Talk a little reality TV. In 2011, in the 23rd season of Survivor South Pacific, you took ninth place, lasted 28 days. First off, did you apply or how'd you get casted? So um, just the complete honest truth. Um, the year before I did it, in 2010, that winter, I got a call from my agent at CAA and he said they were looking for a country artist to be on Survivor. And he said, you're the only one crazy enough that <laughs> would want to do it. <laughs> I'm like, thanks for that. <laughs> and yes, I love that show. I always have. And um, I'm like, yeah, uh, let me let me talk to him. I had no idea what that process looked like, but I filled out all the application. I did all the things. I didn't make a video that year. But, um, so somewhere it just, it, it didn't work out. Also, I was still signed at the label and I had right road now was coming out in April. So I really couldn't take off six weeks of my life and be, um, without reach. So it didn't work out that year, kind of fell through the cracks. And then the next year, 2011 in January, I got a call from somebody I had hosted uh, some event here in Nashville and taking a picture with some of the bachelor people. And it ended up on Facebook. Somebody saw it, um, kind of sought me out and got my number from somebody here in town. It's a small world. <laughs> and so she called me and she's like, Hey, would you want to be on survivor? And I'm like, well, yeah, like I did all that last year. Like I, I applied and everything. She didn't even know I had already applied the previous year. And so I did all of that again. I made a video this time. I actually put a little bit of effort into it. And I had some videos. I went to Iraq uh, the year before that and I had some videos of me like shooting sniper rifles and things of that nature. And, um, and my whole video was based around equating the music business to Survivor. Perfect. So yeah, I got the call to go into uh, casting. And so I did, I went to LA and was there for over a week at the first part of April. I remember the dates, April the 3rd through the 10th, weirdly of 2011. And uh, yeah, I, I had a pretty good idea when I left. Uh, they had, they called me in to get shots to leave the country. So I had a pretty good idea that I had made it on, but New York still has to sign off of, you know, you have, 
all the interviews with Mark Burnett's casting Jeff Probst, like a bunch. And then they still want the New York CBS people to sign off over. So I was kind of waiting when I got back to town, I was waiting for a call to say for sure you're in or you're not. Here's some probably different questions that maybe people haven't asked you about survivor. Mm -hmm. How, How bad is the downtime? On the show? Yeah. It's so boring. That's what I got to figure. It's very boring. Because the majority yeah. of your time is downtime. It is. And you, um, I mean, you also don't want to be doing a lot because you're wasting energy that you need to conserve for a challenge that you know is coming at some point. Um, and you have no food. So you don't want to spend too much time. Like we would go out and fish and, um, you know, spear fish and then also use the net and chum and stuff in the water. And, uh, but you didn't want to do that too much being out in that hot sun all day because you're not really going to eat very much. How much weight did you lose? I only lost like 12 pounds. That's fair amount. 11 for me though, at that time it was a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I got down to like one eleven. So, and then how long did it take you to recover back to where you were before you went in the show? Well, for so interesting. They don't tell you after you get out of the game, you know, I went to Ponderosa for 10 days cause I was still on the uh, jury. So you still had to go to tribal councils and, but you have a cook there and you're able to eat anything. I mean, you want snicker bars, they'll get you snicker bars. I think I had 10 in like one sitting <laughs> And they just let you eat whatever. And I do think it should be more, um, they shouldn't because you've been starved for a month and you'll do anything and you'll Mm -hmm. eat anything and, and you really shouldn't because it makes you sick. So everybody was getting sick. I mean, we had, they call it the survivor swell. If you notice and you watch the end of the seasons, the tribal councils, the jury keeps coming back and they just get fatter and fatter. And puffier and puffier to that final one. Like you really can see the progression. Like your wrists are swollen, your face is swollen, everything's swollen. Um, your body doesn't know how to deal with insulin anymore. And so you just blow up. And so that's what happened. And that lasted, they're like, well, it's it's it'll take you at least a couple months to get back to normal once you even get back home. So it did. It really took several months to, to get back to a normal place. And honestly, I don't know, Keith and I still talk about it and Jim all the time that, um, that, um, we don't know that we're still back to normal yet with food. Wow. Um, yeah, we still eat sometimes like we're starving and we're not, (laughs) it's just so crazy. It like how it affects you. It's weird. But yeah, definitely messed up your relationship with food for a while. And like I say, I don't know that it ever really goes back to normal. I will still find myself at night going and getting like a big heaping bowl of peanut butter. Like that's all you want out there is peanut butter. I don't even like peanut butter. (laughs) And you're just, I'm just sitting in bed, just eating peanut butter. I'm like, I'm not like, I'm not starving. Why am I doing this? And I'm eating something I don't really like. I don't even like it. Exactly. It's so weird, but yeah, it definitely messes with you. And do they allow the contestants to have a disposable camera to shoot some pictures to take with you or no? So not during the game. Okay. Okay. So, um, when we left the game and went to Ponderosa, we had a disposable camera there that we could take pictures with. They took it and we didn't get to come back with it. And they gave it back to us at the finale. Okay. Yeah. So at Ponderosa, you know, when you're out of the game, like the pre jury members, they went to Fiji. We didn't even see them anymore. They left. They had, you know, they went out, did excursions. Like we even did a couple things in Samoa when we were waiting on the show to finish wrapping. We went to, um, gosh, I forget the names now of them, but there was like a big, uh, the trench. That's what it was like a big hole. Uh, we went swimming in that. We would go to restaurants and stuff like that because you're not really worried about in Samoa if there are survivor spoilers out there. You yeah, know? right. And then yeah. in 2014, you met your husband on the show. And in 2014, he was your fiance at this time, Keith Tollefson. 
you guys go on the 25th season of Amazing Race. How was mm-hmm. that for you guys going on that show? Yeah, it was really cool. We wanted to do it, and and neither of us were as big a fans of Amazing Race as we were Survivor. We both, like, I even more so than him, love Survivor. Um, we knew the casting was the same, so there was a good chance that maybe later uh, that we would potentially be called for that. We didn't ask for it, but they called us one day, sure enough. And I think we were pretty much a last minute addition because we went out there in January. Everybody else were solidified. I mean, a lot goes into that show just as far as travel documents, passports, and I mean, driver's license in these other countries and visas and all these things that it's a lot of prep on very end for contestants. So we, um, and I think that started filming and it at the end of May. So yeah, we went out and, uh, yeah, we were one of the last minute additions, but matter of fact, so last minute that we had a wedding planned on June the 12th and we had to, um, cancel it. Was there, uh, some bickering going on between you two out there on amazing race? And there's bickering in everyday life going on between us. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take the amazing race to do that. Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, we, we, we bigger since day one. <laughs> so it was normal um, for you guys. It really, truly is. We are both very brutally honest with each other to the point where maybe we, sh- we shouldn't be so honest, but, um, no, it was great for us. I mean, we came back and got married anyway, so there's that, you know, and we're still going strong. So awesome. But I mean, it, from the way our relationship started it was very much like, very real. There was no, I mean, you saw the good, bad, and ugly from day one. I mean, that's just the only way to put it. You literally see somebody at their worst. I mean, I couldn't have looked uglier um, than a survivor, (laughs) you know? And so it's just like, uh, you know, arguing about who we should vote for, who we should vote out, just having all those conversations and learning how to communicate from day one. I think helped us a lot on Amazing Race. I mean, I feel like it's actually helped us a lot in real life, just period, and building the foundation of a good relationship. And I mean, Amazing Race is tough because I'm such a control freak. And if it wasn't going the way I wanted, I wanted to like control and take the reins. And it might have been Keith's challenge. And so I really couldn't. So that was hard for me. (laughs) Back to some music. In 2013, you had a EP one shot. Where did that, mm. where did that all come from? Cause it seemed like, and I was, you know, looking at all the music you put out, like all of a sudden yeah. here's this boom, this one shot. How did that come yeah. about? That came about, so that was 2013. I mean, I really do forget about that one. Um, that was after survivor. I didn't have a record deal. That was a, I think that one started actually with a Kickstarter had just become a thing. And, uh, so all these artists were using independent artists were using Kickstarter to fund their, uh, recordings. And so that's how I did that one. And actually had my cousin, Jonathan Singleton, which Jonathan's had some huge major success recently with, uh, Luke Combs had several singles and just number one hit after number one hit. And, uh, he actually produced that one for me. And, I don't even know if you can even find it out there anymore. I couldn't find um, it. I okay. couldn't find it. I, I saw the listing, say, but I couldn't find it. Gotcha. So it was out for a little while. And, um, but yeah, that was, it was very like raw. And that I, I loved that about it. Matter of fact, one shot was the first thing I wrote back, wrote when I left, when I got back from survivor and it was about Keith. It's like, you just got one shot. Like, let's, let's just give it a whirl. You never know where it's going to go. But, and I do love that song still, but yeah, I'll have to eventually maybe sometime put that back up because I mean, I have it in my computer. It's just, I guess not uploaded on to like tune core or something. So. And what about the, the song homesick? What is that about? Mm-hmm. So homesick is actually the first of this new stuff. Um, I know you've probably done all your research, but I took a little uh, band detour back a few years ago and started a band called Post Monroe. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. So after 
you know, we had a little bit of success and open for Martina and it was a great time. The music was very different than what I did solo wise. And when all that kind of started falling apart, I started thinking again, like, man, what would I do now? Like, what would I say as an artist? Like, and everybody's like, are you going to do a solo thing again? I'm like, no, I thought post, like I'd put all my eggs in this post Monroe basket. And like, that was my baby. I, I didn't know how to go back to a solo artist. And when I heard that song, um, I didn't write it actually. And that was the first one that I'm like, man, that I love that. It connects with me as a grown up now, as a grown woman. And, you know, it's obviously about wanting your other half to stay home and like, you can't spend enough time together. Like it's that kind of love, you know, you don't even want him to go to work. I told, I, I used to say it, it seemed like the country version of work from home, like that, you know, uh, shoot, uh, fifth harmony single. It's a pop song, but yeah. not quite that, but you know what I'm saying? Yep. That kind of message in a country way. So we released that in February, February 14th, I believe Valentine's day. And then, you know, the next month COVID happened and everybody, instead of being homesick was sick of being home. <laughs> <laughs> Bad timing, right? That's right. Speaking <laughs> of the Post Monroe band, you guys had some pretty good mm -hmm. singles there. No more. Coke yeah. and Rum is, is really good. And that Thank was you. with Ashley Hewitt. And you mm -hmm. said you toured with Martina McBride. So you mentioned you were really putting everything you had in, into this band. Did yeah. you see it continue to grow or did you realize that, okay, this is not going to work out? It was the end of the road for us, unfortunately. And, and it's not because of um, the music wasn't there. I, I think it was. Um, we had started as a trio. We made the transition to a duo. And I just think here in Nashville, you know, it is such a small town. Um, you know, kind of when you brand something and you try to rebrand it as something else, it doesn't always people don't understand. Like, it's like, uh, you've kind of already done that, you know? So it just wasn't connecting here. We couldn't quite build the team around us. Um, so we were looking for management that just wasn't working out. We just couldn't find the right team. And so what good does it do to make good music that nobody ever hears? I if you don't get have that. a team, nobody's going to hear it. Your new single and video is called lightweight. And that song's out now. I know songwriter, people write songs. Did you write it recently or was that song written a while back and you decided to go back to it? It was actually written a, a while back. A few years ago, actually at the beach, I went on a uh, writing retreat with the two girls that were in Post Monroe with me. And my now producer, Michael Carter, um, Ma Michael and I go way back. We've written together 10 plus years at this point. So I had brought him in on the Post Monroe project. And so we were writing for that together. And, um, yeah, we wrote lightweight at the beach and a few, with a few other things as well, came back to town. And once we recorded it, it wasn't right for post Monroe. It wasn't right, right for that project. It didn't match our sound, but what it did match was who I was as a solo artist. And when Michael went back to Michael went to remix some stuff to pitch to other female artists. And he called me and he's like, Hey, what's going on with you? Where are you at in this process? What's going on with Post Monroe? Are y'all still doing that? Are you, what, what's going on? I'm like, I don't really know. Like I'm, I'm at this weird place where like, I feel like it's coming to an end, but I don't know where to go from here, you know? And, um, he's like, well, I've got something I feel like you need to listen to. And so he played me lightweight and it had been a while since I had heard it. I'm like, dang, Ooh, that gets me excited about music again. You know, I, I really didn't know if I went back to being a solo artist, how that would even sound anymore. It'd been so long since I've thought about just myself with not two other people involved. And so he's like, you know, are you cool? Like, let's re-sing it. Let's redo some things. And so we did, we completely redid the whole thing. And he's like, are you cool if I play this for, um, this manager I know, Carrie Edwards, which she manages Luke Bryan. Michael Carter is Luke Bryan's band leader. And he also produces Cole Swindell. And 
a few other people here in town and he, he and Carrie are super close. It's like, sure, play it for, you know, what I have to lose. I, I love Carrie and I, I really would trust her opinion of what this sounds like and if it has a place and if we should proceed to do some more songs. And so she heard it. She lived with it for a little while. And then she told Michael that she couldn't get it out of her head and she wanted to meet with me. So that was two years ago, coming up almost two years ago. And so we started meeting. I think she really wanted to see is like, are you really down to do this again? Like, like, do you want, do you want this? And I do, I did. And I was very excited with the idea of putting together a whole new project just with myself. So that's where it started. And then we started listening to other songs. We started writing for it. And so uh, we've got five things done and I can't tell you when it comes out yet, but it's stay tuned. Stay I'm, tuned. <laughs> I'm going to put a link to the lightweight video for the listeners. You can click on that and give it a listen. And also I'm going to put a link to another video of all she wants. Whitney, talk to me about that song. What, what does that song resonate with you? Cause it's a, it's a, it's a catchy song. Thank you. So we actually wrote that one specifically for this project because we were missing, we were lacking that fun female up tempo, like a really fun song to play live. Um, and so we, we specifically wrote that song. And I, I think a, a lot of my influences probably comes out a little bit in that song, a little Shania influence in there. And uh, very influenced by some nineties country females as well. And so that's kind of where, what we were trying to do with that song. And so, yeah, that came out this past summer. We shot a video like right after quarantine had lifted a little bit and uh, it was a challenge to make it look fun when you just didn't have a lot of people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you pulled it we, off. Uh, we, I feel like we pulled it off you did. For as good as we could. Uh, we had some girls in there line dancing and some girls I knew that, um, and we just had a very, I mean, literally skeleton crew, two guys filming all this stuff. So, um, yeah, we shot that in the summer and then lightweight came next. I made Keith be my love interest in the video and, um, he did it. He was not excited about it though. <laughs> it's not, that is not his, his thing. <laughs> You've talked about the music business a lot. I'm hearing a little bit of this in your voice. So now my question is, what are the challenges for Whitney Duncan in the music business? I've just been here so long. You know, that's, it's a, it's a positive thing, but also at the same time, if you've been here a long time and you haven't had like a breakthrough and I'm talking, you know, a single to hit or, you know, maybe a song that you've written break top 10 or something like that. It is a, it's a struggle. Um, it's just, you know, just getting through some of those, those barriers is hard. I mean, not to mention I'm a female. So in this industry, like I hate to play that card, but it's hard. It's really still very hard and it's getting better. But when I was an artist on Warner brothers, I don't think there were any females that year or those few years that was a new female act that even broke top 40. So I felt it then, and then it kind of got worse and now it's getting better because people are shining a light on it. And it's very, you know, as a child, I grew up with a lot of females on the radio, but radio people don't think, you know, they say, Females don't want to hear other females. And I, I know that's wrong for me. I love female voices. That's what I grew up on. Even though Elvis was my biggest influence, I had many other women that made me want to sing, you know? Um, so that's a challenge. And it's just this, this time right now is a challenge. 2020, as we know, has been crazy and certainly not good for new artists because I literally just got my first set of shows lined up for, 2020 in May when mm. March happened and everything was canceled. So do you have so, shows lined up for 21? I don't yet. Yeah. It's, it's right now. I feel like everything that was in 2020 is just being rescheduled for 2021. So it sets me, sets new artists back, not just me, but in general back 
a good little bit, which is fine. It does give us time kind of to more focus on socials, building that. Um, and just, you know, all we can really do right now is release music. So, and focus on that, which again, coming soon. So yeah, that's kind of where it's at right now. It's just kind of in a weird, weird place where once again, I have to kind of be patient. So you hear that listeners, if you are looking for an artist for 21, you got to get in touch with Whitney Duncan. I'm telling you, go check out her music and then you'll want to bring her in and have her perform for your event or whatever you have. On that note, Whitney, how do people connect with you? I mean, mainly right now it's going to be social media. Um, You can go to my website, WhitneyDuncan.com. I think all of my socials are there on that page. You can see the new releases um, Instagram. I love Instagram. The Whitney Duncan on there. I'm very active on Instagram. I'm getting to be more active on TikTok. It's, it's not my favorite platform, but <laughs> mine neither. Yeah, it's, it's fun. It's different. But the issue is it's just so time consuming and I, it's just not something I have a lot of, I don't have a lot of time right now. Like I'm so busy. Um, everything's starting to kind of pick back up again here. So um, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Facebook, um, Twitter, all the things. Yeah. We'll get them connected. What's on your playlist? Yeah. What does Whitney Duncan listen to? Honestly, um, early morning, I, I'm also an orange theory coach. On okay. this, that's kind of my, my side, side gig. And, um, is definitely another passion of mine is fitness. And so when I, co- I mean, I coach early in the morning, it's like, 4 a.m. I get up. And so all morning long, I am bumping like I'm at the club when I, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's I've, loud. I've been to orange theory. So I know what you're talking you, about. You know what I'm talking about? It's loud and it's fun and it's all the pop hits and it's, you know, we don't really play a lot of country in there. Occasionally Luke Bryan will come on and I'll like send a picture of it to my manager and be like, here, look, look who came up in my playlist today. <laughs> but it's very rare that a country artist comes on there. And so when I get in my car, I need silence. Like I need complete silence. It's like time to decompress. And so I have stopped. Honestly, I don't listen to the radio very much anymore. It's, it's normally me seeking out, you know, if there's a new release from a friend or a songwriter, I know like looking into it and seeing what everybody's got going on. But I am so just in the throes of music so much that now I have started to listen to more podcasts in the car, even because I need, like, I need a little break. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds crazy, but my ears have had enough. And like, if I'm still going to be creative and I'm still going to write songs, sometimes it's better to not listen. I'm the same boat. I listen to podcasts in my car nowadays. I don't listen to music anymore. I listen to music at home, but in the car, it's all podcasts for Mm -hmm. me. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've, I've not super into the podcast world yet. I don't know a whole lot of them, but I have been seeking out some like health and nutrition and stuff like that. And I like things that, yeah, I mean, I like interviews with people and hearing their stories and stuff. So, um, I'm excited to, uh, dive some more into yours. <laughs> That's great. We got some, uh, some pretty good guests that I've had some uh, pleasures of interviewing and finding out their stories. Whitney, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and coming on my show and talking about your story. Uh, This has been fun. Thank you so much, Tommy. It's been a blast. I appreciate you having me on. For show notes, go to our website, beforethelightspod.com. Click on the episode page and you can get all the links there. Follow us on Instagram at Before the Lights Podcast. And for merch, go to Before the Lights Pod slash merch and check out all the brand new apparel we just released last week on the website. Thank you for listening to Before the Lights. I'm Tommy Canale, and until next time, everybody, a salute, a chin-chin. <laughs> <laughs>